In the early 1990s, southeast London was held in the grip of a serial rapist. There was a serious sexual predator on the loose. The savage stalker was particular about his prey. He so frequently used the fear that young mums would have of wanting to protect their children. As the violence intensified... More and more victims were reporting that their attacker had been armed with a knife. His mind would turn to murder. The amount of rage and anger is really off the chart. But were these heinous crimes his destiny? Was he born to kill? This is a guy who feels completely unsafe and who's going to take some kind of action to make sure that his world is protected. The district of Plumstead lies just below the River Thames in southeast London. The multicultural community boasts a busy high street, as well as large tree-lined areas and commons that make up part of the green chain. It encompasses uh, many open parklands and woodland. It does go for many miles and um, takes many routes. It was um, quite a middle-class area, quite well-to-do. It was generally a, a low-crime area where people felt safe. In 1993, Plumstead resident Samantha Bissett was like any other parent, recording fond memories of her four-year-old daughter, Jasmine. This is your flower! My flower? Yeah! Hello, I'm Jasmine's mummy, Sam. The 27-year-old was a doting mum who was intent on giving her daughter the best start in life. <laughs> Sam was a very, um, very strong-minded person. She was quite a feminist. Had a good sense of humour. That used to be my boyfriend under there. What? <laughs> Jasmine was lovely. She got on well with other children, got on with adults. I mean, Sam brought her up really well. Sam, Sam was a good mother. Ah, oh, that was nice. Just the whole life revolved around Jasmine. Samantha lived in a basement flat on the edge of Wynn's Common, a peaceful location for family life. I mean, Sam would often play on the, on the grass here or over the common or all the green spaces round here. But on one November night, this sense of tranquility was torn apart. When I saw that the door was locked, I first that, I thought, oh, they've gone out. So I opened the door and... Um, I mean, it's, I mean, as soon as I looked in, there was a stain on the carpet. I couldn't really tell what it was. I go in the kitchen to clean up, and there's all Sam's clothes all over the cat floor. I thought, has there been a burglary or something? And then, I know, somewhere along the line, I think I sort of twigged there was something seriously wrong. It was something was, was up. An intruder had forced his way into Samantha's flat. A violent struggle happened in the hallway and he stabbed her um, and she probably died quite quickly. He dragged her body into the uh, living room and laid it out and then at some stage went back through the house to Jasmine's bedroom and smothered her in her cot. The Plumstead community was shattered by the tragic news. 
As police set out to investigate the horrific double murder, local resident Robert Knapper was having his own run-ins with the law. He had been arrested for shoplifting. There was an incident where he'd been um, caught firing a, um, an air gun in the woods. The most serious incident, he'd been caught in possession of a firearm. Despite his recent conviction, the 27-year-old would manage to get a job at a local plastics factory. We took Robert Knapper on as a machine operator, which all it meant was packing, sorting, trimming objects that come off the machine. Very boring job. But uh, as a worker, he was as good as anybody else there. He coped quite well. He, d he didn't present any problems. Napper may have appeared to be a reliable worker, but his background was anything but stable. He was born in South East London in 1966, the eldest child of Brian, a driving instructor, and his mother, Pauline. His early years were marred by the uh, violence of his father um, towards his mother. Father eventually left home when he was about seven. And as a result, um, he was looked at by child psychiatrists. There's an account of him at one point uh, using a, a BB gun, one of these uh, uh, um, rifles to shoot out, I think, one of the brothers, and some indications of some degree of violence between brother and sister. Napa would later be diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. He seemed to be very frustrated with, um, with people and, and get into a lot of trouble. A child with Asperger's can have a very difficult time making friends and keeping friends and really knowing what's socially appropriate. Former classmate Bill Peake recalls Napa's difficulties at school. From time to time we would um, work to include Robert in our group, but he never really seemed to fit into any social group really. Uh, he would be with a group for a while, and then he would drift away again and very much be a loner. He was a very intense uh, lad and uh, he would uh, stand very close during any e conversations. It was quite unusual um, in the way that he did that. This unusual behaviour would make him an easy target. Bullying at Abbey Wood School for people like Robert would in involve um, some bullying from both the boys and, and the girls, unfortunately. He would just be the butt of the jokes. He would be the person that attracted the, 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 the flying object or, or whatever in the class. He was the odd one out. Napper's fellow students were unaware that he harboured a tragic secret that may have had a profound effect on his future. In November 1993, a horrific double murder was uncovered in Plumstead, South East London. Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter had been sexually assaulted and subjected to unimaginable violence during a prolonged attack. But this district of London had long been suffering at the hands of a predator. During the 1980s and 1990s, there was a whole sequence of very nasty rapes and sex attacks that took place across quite a broad swathe of South London. This was in a series of parks, and these rapes became known as what were called the Green Chain Rapes. The police investigation was complicated, as they appeared to be dealing with two types of attacks, the first of which were in open areas, such as Plumstead and Winds Common. This is a typical example of the Green Chain Walk. Lanes unmade, adjacent to roads. This is exactly the sort of area where he would target his rape victims. The ones in open country seem to be random 
um, not planned and more or less on the spur of the moment uh, taking advantage of the situation. The second type of attacks were evidently premeditated. The ones where he attacked someone in the house, he appeared to prepare, to stalk, to watch, to use a lot of patience um, and seize his opportunity in a planned way. The predator predominantly had one target in mind, young mothers accompanied by children. You could argue, well, he was just picking victims of availability and those victims were likely to be young mums uh, on the common and used the fear that young mums would have of wanting to protect their children, that he actually sexualised that. And that is a particularly sadistic and I think unique and very unusual feature, that sexualization of fear. It's an aspect of sadism. He wanted to have somebody observe what he was doing to make him feel even more strong, more powerful, than watch the child cry and get so upset when his mother's being raped. And so it came from his own mind and his own psychological need. Conrad Ellum remembers the series of rapes that preceded the murder of his partner, Samantha Bissett. Now this is a stretch of the green chain walk here and what you've got here is someone's back garden and it seems by spying on the houses he'd find out which ones had women on their own and then he'd just climb over the garden fence and if they left the back door open he'd get access to the house. One of the early attacks he had entered the house and raped the mother upstairs in one of the bedrooms while, whilst the children were having their breakfast downstairs. As he left, his parting words were, you should keep your door locked. He's trying to put the blame on the victim. This is a way to say, you asked for it, you left your door open, people are, like me are wandering around. We pick places like this because you make yourself vulnerable. So it's a, first of all, it's a way to blame the victim and feel better about himself. But secondly, it, somebody who doesn't have social skills, it could actually be that he was trying to be helpful. That is a possibility. As the reign of terror continued, Local resident Robert Knapper had set up home in a bedsit in nearby Plumstead High Street. His life had become increasingly isolated. The relationship with his mother had become distant, partly due to Knapper's hatred of his new stepfather. Robert was also tormented by a more deep-rooted issue. There was a report of an incident um, when he was aged about 12 that a, a friend of the family had recommended another person to take the children on a camping holiday. And uh, during this holiday, uh, Robert Knapper was sexually abused. Most people who are abused do not become abusers themselves, but some do and almost all individuals who are abusers have themselves been abused. Um, these are traumas that are very, very difficult for an individual to resolve. This traumatic event is likely to have been exacerbated by Napa's pre-existing Asperger's syndrome. If a person suffering from Asperger's, for example, is abused sexually, they will be much more confused than ordinary children and will have much less resilience afterward. They will feel victimized, they will want to do something to make sure this doesn't happen again. Napa's issues as a child would be further complicated by another diagnosis in his teenage years. In Napa's case, the suggestion was that he had paranoid schizophrenia, and schizophrenia is manifest often by an inability to discriminate reality from imagining. He would claim to have met the Queen. He claimed he was being pursued by the IRA. He had been captured at one time. They'd tortured him, cut off his fingers, which he'd been able to, um, through introducing some process, had managed to grow them again. And fantastical stories like that.
17 miles southwest of Plumstead lies the affluent area of Wimbledon, famed for its tennis championships. The London suburb also boasts a picturesque common. But on one July morning in 1992, the peaceful, family-friendly atmosphere was shattered by the discovery of the body of young mother Rachel Nickell. Homicide advisor Ron Turnbull was one of the first on the scene. The initial reaction for all of us was disbelief that this could have happened in such a peaceful, pleasant place. This is not a secluded area somewhere that you would anticipate an attack. Um, it's, it's open space, even the wooded region where she was found. Her clothes were dishevelled, which intimated to me that there was a sexual aspect to, to her demise. And it was obvious that she had suffered multiple stab wounds. To be so angry and enraged to commit that atrocity uh, 49 times does speak, I think, both to the sort of level of sadism and actually rage. The brutal murder of the young mother had been carried out in front of her two-year-old son. It could be at that point that the child represents something to him. He wants the child to be a witness to the mother's humiliation. So there certainly could be psychological layers to that particular murder. The horrific nature of the attack left the nation in a state of shock. There was a wave of revulsion about the circumstances surrounding the murder of Rachel Nickell. Obviously, there was a great public demand for the police to find whoever had done it. Following an appeal to the public, local loner Colin Stagg came to the forefront of their investigation and would become the prime suspect. He had a number of minor offences of a sexual nature involving the common. He fitted the description of um, some of the witnesses. There were some, you know, what were interpreted as black magic symbols in his house. And it was easy for the police to latch onto and say, aha, look, there's a reason, you know, to think that he might be a violent sex criminal. The police were confident they had their man. The horrific knife attack would not be linked to the green chain rapist of Southeast London. However, the rapist was still at large, and it appeared he was starting to emulate the Wimbledon attack. The initial incidents didn't feature any violence at all, but gradually there was an escalating pattern of violence, and more and more victims were reporting that their attacker had been armed with a knife. If you look at the series of, of green chain rapes, what you really have is a pretty uh, sexually impotent offender. Most of these attacks are, um, you know, the offender fails to get an erection. There's severe violence after the attack, almost as if, you know, because this was sort of deeply unsatisfying in terms of the physical sexuality, that the, then the violence has to take over as a kind of proxy for that. In some of his crimes, the offender was supremely aggressive. As the green chain attacks intensified, police appealed to the public. Amongst the named suspects matching the EFIT was local Plumstead resident Robert Knapper. One of the biggest problems for the police was that descriptions of the rapist were, were varied and vague. The man that they were told they were looking for was described as being five feet eight inches tall. Detectives went to see him and in fact, Napa was considerably taller at about six foot two. So, essentially, wrote him out of the inquiry. Despite being brought to the attention of police, Napa would do little to raise concern amongst his co-workers. From what I can remember, Robert was very nondescript, very quiet. He would speak, he would enter into conversation. If you spoke to him, he didn't particularly instigate a conversation. He kept very much to himself. He was a very bland, grey man. 
female colleagues would also feel comfortable in his company. Most of the girls who worked at the factory had to go up to Plumstead High Street. Of a night time, when it got dark, it was quite spooky, quite... made you quite nervous walking through there. Robert Knapper lived up in uh, Plumstead High Street, so he naturally walked up with them. We never had any complaints or any worries from any of the girls at all. Despite his courteous manner, authorities became increasingly aware that Napa's out-of-work interests were less than scrupulous. It was reported that a peeping Tom was looking at the backs of the houses here, specifically upon a young lady who lived alone. Police were called and arrested one Robert Napa. I think for Napa, it's probably a degree of control in it and, and obviously sexual pleasure as well. Probably also propped up by the fact that, that any of the women that he probably did try and say hello to probably shunned him because he was odd and bizarre. Napa's arrest allowed police to search his flat in Plumstead High Street. The bedsit where um, Napa was arrested were, was just one room. Um, it was kept very tidy. Everything was put in its place. Also at the scene, we found a, a red metal toolbox which contained hunting knives. We found lots of um, doodles. We found an A to Z with um, little roots planned out. The map in question covered an area around the Green Chain Walk the location of the horrific rapes that had terrorised the London suburb. During 1992, Plumstead resident Robert Knapper was arrested following complaints about a peeping Tom. While searching his flat, police discovered a red toolbox containing knives and a doodled map. The sketches were centred around areas of parkland which had become the hunting ground for the Green Chain Rapist. Local resident Conrad Ellum knew the area well. This was listed as one of the places. Like he had some comments or something about it's OK when it's dry or something, or see, when it's wet down here, it's too muddy, and maybe he was saying that no one comes down here when it's muddy. Despite receiving an eight-week jail sentence for the possession of a firearm, the other contents of Napa's box were not linked to the Green Chain rapes. The campaign of terror would become increasingly violent throughout 1992 and 1993. The gruesome murders of Plumstead mother Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter Jasmine would be the tragic consequence. Detective Sergeant Alan Jackerman was amongst the first on the scene. This is the main entrance to Heathfield Terrace. It leads down these stone steps to the main entrance, which you see below. It looks just the same as it did as when I entered with my colleagues on the 3rd of November, 1993. Just inside the front door, we found large poolings of blood and further inside lay the bodies of Jasmine and Samantha Bissett. Long-term partner Conrad Ellum had made the appalling discovery on his return to the flat that morning. I walked into the front room and um, there was just this sort of pile of clothes and you could see sort of arms and legs sticking out. I couldn't really see much, but I'm just thinking, this is awful, Sam's... You know, I couldn't even see if it was Sam or not, but... Then it just hit me that I hadn't seen Jasmine. I thought, is she, is she in there or what? I looked in the bedroom and you could see, she was covered in the duvet, so you couldn't really... At first, I thought she might still have been alive. 
but I could just see she wasn't moving, so. Jasmine's mother, Samantha, had suffered multiple stab wounds. Her body had also been hideously mutilated. We felt a gut feeling, really, that, that this was a really unusual killing. Obviously, this wasn't a first offence. There had to be a lead up to this. There had to be a progression towards such a, an horrific event. Forensic examination of the scene initially drew a blank. Every fingerprint that was lifted in that flat was identified. Um, so we believed that the perpetrator must have been wearing gloves. But further investigation revealed an incredible coincidence that would finally unlock the case. The fingerprints between the perpetrator and the victim, Samantha, were almost identical. Now, we all know from watching TV programs that no two fingerprints can ever be identical, but there were very, very many similarities. And the first person to look at them had made a mistake and written those fingerprints off as Samantha's. Luckily for us, the um, fingerprints were on record and they came back to Robert Napper. Napper was arrested in his bedsit on nearby Plumstead High Street. Police began building a case against their prime suspect. Sam it did say she was in bed one night and um, she, she said there was a face actually in the window. Just that one occasion. And that's, that was she scared and that, I guess that would have been Napa. The killer's planning had been measured, but the murder was frenzied. There was a very, very vicious attack. Uh, where he immediately stabbed uh, Sam Bissett um, uh, so vigorously, actually, that he may well have almost immediately killed her. Dragged her into the lounge uh, and then um, committed some horrific mutilations on the body. A pathologist would uncover another disturbing side to the attack on Samantha. When he pieced Samantha's body back together, realised there was a large part of the stomach wall missing, a square of about six inches. That part of her body has never been recovered. An organised offender who knows what they're doing will take a trinket, an earring, a shoe, something like that. A, a, someone with a serious mental illness tends to take a body part or does biting behavior or cutting or um, post-mortem experimentation, looking around at things inside the body. That's, that's typically a mental illness. The only witnesses to the murders had reportedly heard two assailants' voices. Napa's mental state may offer an alternative explanation. One of the witnesses heard shouts from two men um, along the lines of, leave it, leave it. We now believe that that was Napa shouting at himself. With Napa in custody, his connection to the heinous crime was startling news for many of his acquaintances. The atmosphere in the factory afterwards was just a, a, a absolute shock because it's not every day you come across something like this in your, in your normal life. Robert, who was a very quiet uh, lad at school, it was quite a, a shock, I think, to myself, I'm sure, to many other people that we went to school with, particularly the, the violence of the crime. I think people find it odd to imagine that one day someone can be at work getting on with a job in the knowledge that they've also committed horrific offences. But the reality is they're not slathering 
easily identifiable monsters. Typically, serial killers who want to continue to get away with what they're doing are going to form a double life. They're going to have that life of murder and mayhem and rapes that is compartmentalized, completely divided away from the life they need to live in order to pass as a normal person. It would soon become apparent that the double murder was not a solitary act for the 27-year-old. On further examination of Napa's toolbox, police became acutely aware of the tattered map stored inside. Napa had made a number of notes on those maps, and those notes corresponded to the settings of a number of the so-called green chain rapes. In his bed set were found various doodles, which mentions this part, and specifically parts of this common, amongst which was stroppy circle which referred to small group of birch trees here on my right. It gave a good view to the rear of a house where one of his victims was raped. It appeared that the four-year reign of terror that had preceded the murders of Samantha and Jasmine Bissett may have been at the hand of Robert Napper. I have very little doubt that Napa did commit most of the green chain rapes. There were 70, possibly 80 in that sequence, and I think that all the evidence points to the fact that he committed most of those. If you know that rape is a relatively rare offence, and here you have tens of these rapes occurring together in the same sort of area, you'd have to seriously consider that they'd be com committed by the same person. Napa's first rape is thought to have taken place in 1989 in a house on the edge of the common. The attack left him in a confused state. He felt compelled to confess all to his mother. He said to his mum, there's some people out to get me because I raped a woman on Plumstead Common. And then she went, his mother went straight to the police and said to them, oh, my son just says he's raped a woman on Plumstead Common. You should look into this. And they looked in their records and said, well, there's no record of that, no record of a rape being reported on Plumstead Common. The attack had actually taken place on neighbouring Winds Common. Subsequently, police records did not match the mother's report. I think as Napa went on, he probably felt a degree of invincibility because he was able to get away with it for so long. And as with anything that you do repetitively, you start to learn effectively what works. Napa's laid-back career and lifestyle may have been chosen by design. Robert was quite a reasonably educated man, if I remember rightly. So in retrospect, it makes you wonder why he took such a menial, boring job. There are different reasons why someone might take menial jobs that are really below his level of intelligence and skill. Uh, it could be that they feel inadequate, they feel insecure, they don't really know that they can live up to their potential and so they don't try. But it also could be that they want extra time to stalk people, to just have the time it takes to do the planning of an assault. Experts believe his targeting of women with children stemmed from the sexual abuse he suffered as a child at the hand of a family friend. The amount of rage and anger um, that is left in a child who is abused in this type of repetitive and sadistic way is really off the chart. And psychologically, you could see how that probably had some significance wherein Napper would get women who were with children. But it had very, very personal meaning to Napper. He was trying to work something out internally by behaving in this way. These painful childhood memories are thought to have been exacerbated by Napper's sense of inadequacy as the rapes intensified. When a man is impotent, when he's trying to rape a, a woman and can't quite do it, to him, she's to blame. He is going to now get violent and because he's angry, she has humiliated him. She's witnessed his humiliation and it's her fault that he can't 
pull this off and that he's now a failure. And then, of course, there's the, the use of a knife. It's actually quite difficult to avoid the Freudian analogy, but, it, but um, the knife seemed to often be used as a proxy uh, um, for an erection. In Napa's case, I think it is safe to say that, that, that knives were an obsession. There was a collection that he had of knives. Uh, they were regularly used in the offence to the point of extreme overkill and a kind of morbid fascination with, with what a knife could do to a body. Just three months after Robert Napper's arrest, the case against Colin Stagg for the Wimbledon murder of Rachel Nickell was thrown out of court. Unknown to police, vital evidence that would help convict the actual killer would be provided by a red toolbox belonging to Robert Napper. In October 1995, Robert Napper stood trial at the Old Bailey, accused of the horrific double murder of Samantha Bissett and her four-year-old daughter, as well as a series of rapes carried out in South East London. At the time, we weren't convinced that we were going to get a conviction. Taken in isolation, each of the pieces of evidence against him wouldn't have been enough to convict him, but taken together, we felt we had a case. Despite initial concerns of the police, a verdict by the jury was not required. He pleads guilty to manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility to the murder of Samantha and her daughter. In other words, he was suffering from mental disturbance at the time, and in fact, he's sent to Broadmoor, the maximum security psychiatric hospital. There was still, of course, the nagging problem of who murdered Rachel Nickell. The case against the prime suspect, Colin Stagg, had been thrown out of court just one month earlier. Once again, the police were under intense pressure to solve the Wimbledon common murder. You can be a homicide detective with 25 years experience and not need any assistance at all in a murder case, but you will in a sexual murder case. All of the typical investigative approaches, motive, opportunity, really go out the window in a sexual murder case. Although Napa's murder of Samantha and Jasmine bore marked similarities to the Wimbledon murder, the distance between the attacks initially ruled him out. We know that offenders want to offend near enough home so that, it's a, that you know, they're able to get back home quickly and it's an area with which they're very familiar. However, further investigation of the map book used to document Napa's green chain attacks suggested he had ventured out of his comfort zone. On one of the pages, heavily marked, was Isabella Plantation on Richmond Park. That is within walking distance of Wimbledon Common where Rachel was murdered. This attracted our interest. Police interviewed Napa in Broadmoor during December 1995. He refused to answer any questions. Ten years would pass before DNA evidence finally solved the Wimbledon case. All of Rachel's clothes that she was wearing on the day she was murdered was very heavily bloodstained. Police had techniques in their armory that enabled them to lift the blood off of her clothing and what lay below was a microscopic sample of somebody else's blood. It was proved to come from Robert Napper. Rachel's horrific murder had tragically been witnessed by her two-year-old son. A crucial piece of evidence had been extracted from his hair. There were small pieces of paint that they were able to forensically match to a metal toolbox. The toolbox in question belonged to Robert Napper. Napa would finally be charged with the murder of Rachel Nickell in November 2007. Napa appeared before the Old Bailey and actually pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of Rachel Nickell, again, as with Samantha Bissett, on the grounds of diminished responsibility. 
I think what's interesting in the Kell murder is you initially did not plead guilty and only in the fullness of time pled guilty when he realised that actually that forensic evidence was, was extremely damning. So again, I think it speaks to the idea that this wasn't someone so delusional that they thought they still couldn't get a get out at the last minute. Napa was returned to Broadmoor Hospital, where he will be detained indefinitely. The horrific violence suffered at the hand of this disturbed killer is hard to comprehend. But was this reclusive loner the victim of his troubled childhood? Or was he born to kill? I think the cards, the deck was stacked up against Napa. He um, had severe psychiatric problems. He also managed, more through luck than judgment, to get away for a while with a series of heinous crime. And I think this imbued him with a sense of invincibility. I think Napa's a classic case of, of nature meeting nurture in all the most awful ways. It's partly nature, but unless you have the nurture aspect of it going in the wrong direction, then I don't believe anyone's born to kill. I don't believe Robert Napa was born to kill. I think the assault when he was 12 changed his life. Someone with Asperger's disorder is unlikely to be violent, so really the events of his life are the things that formed him into a killer. The true extent of Robert Knapper's crimes may never be known. But for a new generation enjoying the green open spaces to the south of London, the horror has faded away. However, some will never forget those who lost their lives. It certainly has changed my outlook on life. I mean, I've tried to be positive about things. The memory's always there. I don't know if they could, could ever get justice. I mean, nothing's ever going to bring them back. I mean, you know, Jasmine would be 24 if she's still alone now. She'd probably have children of her own. And I don't think there could ever be justice for something like that. <laughs>